It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry Lasser and Ned Calmer. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Carl Gruber, Austrian ambassador to the United States. Dr. Gruber, you were a member of the Austrian resistance movement during the war and you've been involved in its foreign policy ever since. Now, the big four Western powers have met at least 400 times to discuss the terms of a peace treaty for Austria, the one that was promised 10 years ago, and nothing has happened. Do you feel discouraged about it? Well, my answer to that is no, I do not feel discouraged. I do not see an immediate prospect of a treaty, but you see, we have a history of almost a thousand years, and I think we can survive a few radical doctrines which are bound to come, perhaps. Well, when we accepted the uh, terms for the, an Austrian peace treaty, I think that was 1943, uh, Mr. Molotov refused uh, at that time to uh, do any more about it. Then at Berlin, we accepted the terms, the Russian terms for an Austrian peace treaty, and Mr. Molotov refused to go along with that. Now, do you feel that uh, this means the end of the whole thing? Well, first I want to say this was a very good diplomatic move from your side because uh, they had to show their hands now and declared quite openly that even if you sign the proposed treaty, which they proposed, I would want to say, they would not be ready to go. So this ends one phase of the treaty making, but there are more to come. And I think uh, we have not to drop hope for the next future. What do you mean, in other words, that these uh, 375 or 380 meetings meant actually nothing because we accepted all the Russian terms and they showed their actual hand that they must keep troops in Austria. Does that mean that an Austrian peace treaty is dependent upon a settlement with Germany, do you suppose? Well, perhaps not exactly on Germany, but apparently they want to use Austria as a pawn in their uh, overall game. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as we have not uh, much more development between East and West, I think uh, we, we cannot expect any sudden development. But I'm quite hopeful that the time will come where they will think again about their policy, and then I think we will get our treaty. Well, Dr. Gruber, the uh, Soviet policy now seems to be the scrapping of the European defense plan, which would include Germany and its army. Do you feel if they succeeded in scrapping that the EDC, as we call it, they would then sign an Austrian peace treaty? Well, you never know. You, s you say they said very often, if you fulfill this condition, then we will sign the treaty. And then we did this, and then they came with something new. So you never can predict, and they would not be too sure what they do if this condition is really then. Well, Mr. Ambassador, aren't the Austrians getting a little bit weary of living under Soviet rule, occupation? How long has this been going on now? Well, it's going on since the end of the war, as you know, and they are certainly fed up with it. There's no doubt about that. Do the Russians make themselves objectionable? Have they changed in that period of occupation? Well, they changed a little bit. They did at least a better dressing of their window, but they still run 300 factories by their Russian management, and they exploit the oil. So there's qu quite a great drain on our economy. Well, has that changed the traditional gay life of Vienna at all? Do not too much, not too much. Vienna? Luckily enough, uh, Viennese have a great, uh, at least passive strength, and they keep to their habits. Well, on the lines of that, I might ask you, Dr. Gruber, what do you people do in the traditional coffee houses of Vienna for coffee now? Well, you see, they try to get good coffee still. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive as before the war, but they're quite happy there. I see. Well, uh, incidentally, Moscow has now proposed that uh, Russia be invited to join the, the NATO pact, which is an anti-communist pact, and they've also proposed, of course, that the United States be allowed to join their pan-European security service system. Now, do you think that's a propaganda move, or should we take it seriously? Well, I have not seen the text yet, so I would uh, like to reserve my comment, but from my past experiences, I would not immediately start too great an optimism on it. But you don't think that that uh, proposal would have any uh, reaction on the future of Austria? Well, I don't see any immediate result of it. I think we have to wait what <laughs> further they might do and what proof they want Mr. to give. Mr. Ambassador, uh, about, the, about the future of Austria, it seems to me that the Trieste problem over which Italy and Yugoslavia are embroiled also affects Austria, does it not? Well, we have certainly a very strong economic interest there because this is the port where we really export most of our trade. 
and for this reason we are interested at first as good order and not any uh, major trouble between Italy and Yugoslavia and that our economic interests they are protected because you might remember that this harbor was developed in the Austrian time and we still feel very friendly to the people and we hope that the settlement will be reached whereby we can keep our interests going there. And Dr. Grubb, how do you get along with your other communist neighbors, with Hungary, with Poland, with Czechoslovakia? Do you have much trade with them? Well, our trade dropped considerably. We had 40% uh, of our whole foreign trade went to the east before the war. It's now down to 10%. There's still some trade, and we need some trade, there's no doubt, because you cannot replace 50% uh, of your trade in uh, such a short time. But uh, the whole thing is not uh, too easy to contact because, you know, there's this part by our policy whereby they have sealed off their frontiers and so it's not so prospective for the next future. Well, if Austria has lost 50% uh, of its trade, how do you manage to live there? Well, we replaced it by trade in other directions, which was not easy to do, but luckily enough we could manage at least to replace some of this trade by other directions. Huh? And the creation of the European uh, Payments Union, which was a result of the Marshall Plan, as you might remember, did a great, uh, was a great help in this respect. Uh, Dr. Rube, I know you left Austria actually right after the Anschluss with Nazi Germany, but can I ask you a personal question? Do you think that Austria is a uh, viable political body? Can it survive without a new Anschluss with Germany and its trade and its industry? Well, I would say this. I mean, any country can live if the others are ready to let it live. So the life of a small country or of a middle, even of a middle-sized country will always depend on what general trade system you can set up. And I think Austria has certainly enough resources to be viable. And uh, we would be very hopeful as soon as the political trouble are settled for Austria, then I think we are completely in a position to survive. But do you have any internal troubles? Is your domestic political life in Austria fairly Not stable? We have not too much trouble. We always have frictions, as there might be in any human institution. But I think the Russians keep us together. It's the Russians who keep you More together. Uh, I take it that you don't have any communist problem internally in Austria, sir? Practically none, because by in three elections now we had less than 5% of communists in our country. Well, Dr. Gruber, in 1943 the Russians promised that Austria would be regarded as a liberated country occupied by the Germans and uh, after the war they never agreed to this uh, liberation policy anymore and they still occupy Austria. Now do you feel this marked a change in their policy? Well I can't see a great change. They have they had always led the policy in Austria of the status quo. That means uh, they are not too unpleasant on the whole but they want to keep their troops there and keep the military position and they are not likely to change this policy if there are no major considerations in other fields. No? which you can easily see as a result of the Berlin Conference. No? Mm. How are they getting along on the famous international patrol in Vienna? The four men in a jeep? Do they well, it's still running well? around, still run running around, and I think they at least keep a fair amount of understanding between them. No? But Dr. Grubo, why do you suppose that the Russians have acted more differently in Austria than they have in Germany? We haven't the, the trouble, there aren't the clashes between East and West Germany that they're that they, they haven't got those clashes in Austria now. Why do you suppose that has happened? This whole climate seems to be quite different there. Well, there are many reasons that would be quite a long story to tell, but one of the main reasons is this, that right from the beginning we had that central Austrian government who kept the country together and one currency. And then I think the whole policy was a little bit different uh, connect, uh, concerning Germany and concerning Austria. In Austria they just want to keep it, let's say, as a military basis and they had well, not the intentions to create it as a direct satellite of the Russian Empire. No? So you feel that there is no intention then of uh, partition of Austria at any time by the uh, Soviet Union? No. Well, do you feel, uh, do you feel there that uh, you would like the, the Western allies to leave the country also? Well, not certainly not alone. I mean, be not before the Russians have gone out. I mean, that certainly would be against our But well, there policy. is no demand from the population that the, that the foreign troops leave Austria now. Well, they, if, if they leave, then they should leave together and should leave. If the ra last Russian soldiers get out, then I uh, would be happy when others go, but not a single day be before that. No? May I ask you, sir, how the Austrian people now feel about the people over here in America? Oh, very friendly. I think you certainly will find that in our country, at least, the great help which you have given to our people had good results, and you will find them very friendly disposed. 
And this is a lasting friendship, I can assure you. Mr. Mesro, may I ask you as a final question? Do you feel that the tensions which now exist in the world, the international tensions, are relaxing or are they getting worse? How do you feel they, they are tending towards the future of Austria? That's certainly hard to say because we have reached a stationary situation in Europe at least not where there was not great changes on frontiers and on regions between East and West in the last months or years. And so it depends much uh, how the other issues might turn out. It's still critical and still dangerous, but we hope. And you see, I always think optimism is as costly as pessimism, for this reason I'm an optimist. Well, do you think we're moving towards a negotiating stage? We have a lot of international conferences set up. I'm thinking particularly of the one at Geneva. Well, I would say we, we move to a talking stage, which doesn't mean that we are moving to a negotiating stage. This is much too early to judge, no? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gruber. Privileged to have you here tonight. Thank you. The opinions expressed on the Longines chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines chronoscope was Larry Lasser and Ned Calmer. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Carl Gruber, Austrian ambassador to the United States. One of the most important contributions which Longines watchmakers have made to the science of timing was to originate the idea that sports events should be officially timed with identical watches of known and proven accuracy. Now, to implement this idea, Longines created a new watch, accurate second by second. And it's this Longines Olympic timer. A completely new timepiece, it was engineered from the ground up for its own special purpose. The accuracy of each individual Longines Olympic timer is evidenced by its own bulletin from Neuchâtel Government Observatory. And I might observe that as the Longines Olympic timer is engineered to its special purpose, so is every other Longines watch. But beyond engineering, Longines watches are superlatively manufactured. And this superlative quality of manufacture pays off for you in better timekeeping, better reliability, and long life. Ten World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing are proof that Longines watches are among the finest in all the world. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, remember these facts. And remember this, too, that you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. From coast to coast, by more than 4,000 leading jewelers, who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. There is only one Atmos, a perpetual motion clock created by Lacoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by unfailing daily variations in the temperature of the air. Atmos, product of Lacoultre, division of Longines Wetnor. <laughs>